Right, good afternoon everyone. A uh, very warm welcome to the Scottish Parliament. So my name is Professor Martin Hendry. I'm Vice Principal and Clerk of Senate at the University of Glasgow and Vice President of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which is Scotland's National Academy. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2024 Festival of Politics, although I imagine many of you have been involved in events over the last few days already. Uh, and this year um, celebrates the festival's 20th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages and from every walk of life to engage in five days of spirited debate. Um, so I'm looking forward to our discussion this afternoon and hearing everyone's views and thoughts. And it's important that we do that in uh, a manner which gives everyone the opportunity to contribute, even where there may be differences of opinion and that we treat each other respectfully at all times. So we're delighted we can, uh, that you can join us today to participate in Reading Between the Lines, Information Literacy in the 21st Century. And this is organised in partnership with the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Childlight Global Child Safety Institute at the University of Edinburgh. So later I'll be inviting you, the audience, to get involved with um, your questions and comments. And if you're keen to throw your thoughts out there, you can do so by tagging um, at Visit Scott Parle. P-A-R-L, on X, or using that hashtag on Instagram. Um, so I'm very pleased to be joined here today by Dr Fiona McNeil, Angela uh, Balakrishnan, and Jason Box, and also Zoe Lamborn. So I'll introduce them all in turn. Uh, Fiona is a reader in computer science education at the University of Edinburgh. She represents the British Computer Society in the RSE's Learned Societies Group, and she chairs the BCS Scottish Computing Education Committee. Uh, Angela is Executive Director of Strategic Communications and Public Affairs with the Information Commissioner's Office. She co-chairs the UK Regulators Communications Network and is part of the Women in PR Committee. And Jason is a partner at RXN Group in Washington DC. He's worked in public affairs and opinion research for more than 20 years with expertise in communications and digital research, reputation and brand management, and political strategy. And lastly, joining us online is Zoe Lamborn, who is Director of Strategy, Child Light, Global Child Safety Institute. Zoe comes from a background of working with governments and agencies globally to improve public safety, specifically designing and building new multi-sector organisations. So Fiona, Angela, Jason and Zoe, a very warm welcome to you all and thank you for agreeing to join our panel today. So as I mentioned before, there'll be an opportunity shortly for the audience to put questions and views to the panel. That will happen a little later in our event. But I'd like to open by putting a series of initial questions to our panellists. And I'll direct these starter questions to some of you in the first instance, recognising your particular experience and expertise. But of course, you're all welcome to share your thoughts about each of these topics as you wish. And I'm confident that they'll help to stimulate questions and comments from the audience as we move to that phase of our discussion um, later. So let me begin with um, Zoe and invite Zoe um, to, to offer her thoughts on the following. So in the current political and social climate, Zoe, how can we ensure the internet is a safe space for young and vulnerable people while also protecting freedom of speech and expression of opinion across the political spectrum? Well, Martin, what a fantastic question to, to kick off this panel with, not starting with easy ones, right? Nope. So first of all, I would like to recognise that it is a very real tension, so particularly between safety and privacy, safety, expression of opinion, and that has been amplified in recent years. But it's disappointing because this discussion has been going on for 15 years, and 15 years on, we're still having that same polarised debate about privacy or safety. But coming from Childlight, a global data institute that's based at the University of Edinburgh, we look at the prevalence and nature specifically of child sexual exploitation and abuse around the world. And our research says that we're now dealing with huge, enormous numbers of children who are being abused or exploited online around the world every day. So our research says within the last year, for example, 300 million children have been victims of exploitation or abuse online. 300 million, that's one every minute. And because of those staggering numbers, we have to be moving the conversation to not being about one or the other, safety or privacy, because we all have a shared duty of care and responsibility. And because of the size of those numbers, we very much start to see this as a public health issue. So looking at safety, 
moving to prevention, not just responding. So I would say that one of the ways to get us thinking through is bringing safety and privacy together. So realizing that both of those things can coexist. And this is, shouldn't be a, a new principle for people because we've got principles that we all buy into already around safety, whether it's our, our cars, our food, our homes, the same should apply to our online environment, and online spaces. So for me, starting to go right back to shared principles, regardless of freedom of speech or expression or political spectrum, we should all agree that children have a right to be safe from harm. And particularly then when we're looking in terms of what needs to be done, I would love to see more of a move to thinking about how we can bring people together for prevention. So again, picking up on a public health approach to recognize that these numbers are just too big. And if I was trying to put a metaphor to it to really bring it to life, if we had people falling off of a cliff and hurting yeah. themselves, we wouldn't just send ambulances to patch people up. We'd look at the guardrails to put in place at the top of the cliff and stop it from happening in the first place. So for me, we have to start thinking about shared principles and coming together and recognizing that both have to coexist because the status quo, that polarized conversation, it needs to change. Thanks, Zoe. As you noted, it was quite a... Um... A, a broad question to begin with, and, and your answer has, has opened up um, a number of different avenues. Angela, I saw you nodding your head at a few points um, in Zoe's answer. Anything you would like to, to, to pick up on there? Absolutely. So, um, as Zoe said, privacy and safety aren't mutually exclusive, and privacy and innovation aren't mutually exclusive either. Um, hands up, I'm sure we're all on social media. We all use the internet day to day. We don't want to trade... Um, our choice to be able to use all these great innovations in digital services, and we shouldn't have to choose between one or the other. Um, so coming at it from the Information Commissioner's office, we're looking, at, we're looking at data protection and how our information is protected online. And we know that um, how our information is profiled can mean that sometimes we are served with harmful content, um, and that shouldn't be the case. Um, we are really clear uh, that children's safety and privacy shouldn't be traded in the chase for profit, especially as these services are introduced and developed. So three years ago, we introduced the Children's Code, which is a whole set of standards that we expect uh, online services, so social media platforms, video streaming services, to be adhering to if they are providing services that are targeted at children. Um, and that means making sure that they are limiting the use of personal information, so it's absolutely necessary to the provision of that service. They're not processing young people's information in a way that could cause them harm. So, for example, using their information to profile them with content um, that could cause them harm or sharing their location with strangers so that they might be contacted by people that they don't want to be contacted by, and that their privacy settings are high, um, put on high as default. And these are all really simple, straightforward steps that these companies can and should be taking. Ideally, though, it shouldn't be retrospective, as um, Zoe said. You know, we really advocate for privacy by design. So when these services are being developed, thought about, built, um, you know, thinking about the user and how to make sure that these safeguards are put into place from the outset. So we're not having to kind of chase down um, and tackle these uh, issues and harms, but we can actually make sure that those safeguards are put in place from the outset. Thanks, Angela. So we'll, we'll come back to some of those points in a moment. Let me just now turn to Jason and Fiona and see if there's any, any thoughts you want to share in, on this broad theme that's kicked us off. I'm going to be the skunk at the party. Uh, I, I, I don't think you can have both privacy and safety. I, I think they, they compete for a lot of the same ground. Uh, take as, just as, as an example, um, there was a shooting in, uh, in the U.S. a few years back um, there was an opportunity to, uh, to solve the crime, but it involved lowering the safety level, the privacy levels on a phone, like breaking into a phone. But by virtue of breaking into the phone and providing the, the technology, the tool to break into the phone, you've, re you've reduced the safety or the, the privacy protection in, uh, in exchange for privacy. I, I think they're both aspirational, but I think like most compromises, I think both sides are left unhappy with the outcome, but that might actually be the best outcome. But does that suggest that, that one at least needs to have some kind of protocols to no. deal with particular circumstances? Course, no, I think there's a necessary but not sufficient that balance on, on between, totally. Yeah. And like the role of government, the role of business, the role of citizens to take some of this into their own hands. You know, we talk about being uh, digitally literate or uh, having an information literacy, the ability to to make good choices, but also have 
boundaries set, which I think yeah. are, are critically important, but to also recognize that um, there's only so much you can do. Uh, GDPR was what, two, three, how long ago was it now? Th th uh, so four, four years, six years ago, I can't even do math. <laughs> six years ago, um, in no way eliminated digital or online fraud. Uh, it, it's just, you can try to rein it in, but I don't think you can eliminate it. I think if we can accept that and just push really hard on both sides, and we'll yeah. end up in the middle, which is like the happy medium. So, you know, we're going to explore some ways in which our formal education system might help to create the kind of infrastructure to assist with, with all of this. I might ask you to keep your powder dry for a moment then on that, you know, because we'll, we'll turn to you in a moment to lead us off on, on that avenue of discussion. But, Angela, you already highlighted, um, you know, the, the role of, of social media companies in, in safeguarding, particularly around verifying their ages. Um, how do you think we can better incentivise that, you know, to, as I might naively think, surely it's in those companies' best interest just in terms of managing their reputation, managing their brand, but that doesn't seem to happen as much as, as, as I might naively think. So what can we do to, to oil the wheels of that to make it happen more frequently, more proactively? So I think young people's expectations are changing. We've done some research recently at the ICO and um, it's really clear that parents and young people care about their safety online. Um, but I think they do feel the pressure to uh, not miss out on digital services. Um, so they do click accept cookies. They probably just say yes to the privacy policy but that's not to say that they don't care about the issue and I think um, they're starting to make their voice heard on that so for instance um, we know that young people are consistently turning their location um, uh, settings off on services like Snapchat but they're not doing it consistently across all social media platforms. So I think it's trying to play some of that back to the social media companies, making them see that they have a responsibility in the same way as a society. We have a responsibility to young people to help look after them until they're able to make sort of key decisions for themselves. The same safeguards apply online. And uh, as I said, the Children's Code that the ICO introduced three years ago is making a tangible difference in uh, seeing some of those changes being pushed through. So over the last three years, we've seen some of the social media platforms turn off targeted um, advertising. Uh, they've made sure some of them have blocked adults from contacting children, which was a really important step, um, stopped notifications being pushed at bedtimes. But this is an ongoing endeavour. You know, there are so many digital services out there, new ones popping up all the time children being um, moved to uh, new services as well. So it's a marathon, not a sprint. And uh, yeah, we're, we're continuing with that work. Uh, we've reached out to 11 new um, social media platforms and video streaming services to ask them again. The code has been in place for three years. There are a whole set of expectations that we've been very clear about. So we want them to either explain how they're looking after children's privacy um, if they uh, can't explain, then they are expected to make sure that they are looking after children's privacy or we will take action. And we did. Last year, we fined TikTok £12 million because they were unlawfully using children's information and not taking adequate steps to make sure that underage children were on that platform, kicked off that platform. So. Yeah. Thanks, Angela. So I sense that we will, of course, return to that theme of regulation and, and, and how to make it more effective as we go along. But I'll turn now to Fiona then and see if we can broaden out a little further into the role of education, you know, whether formal or informal, um, to, to help um, educate our young people, although not necessarily just our young people. Again, hopefully we can explore that too, and uh, to develop the knowledge, skills and awareness needed to control how their information is used online. So what, what are your um, initial thoughts on that? Well, I think schools are absolutely fundamental to this. I think the ability to navigate a digital world, to understand how to balance contrasting information, how to recognise mis misinformation, how to have these difficult conversations and so forth. This is a fundamental life skill that all young people need to have. So I think it's absolutely crucial that it's provided in schools. I think that families and communities are often not in a good place to provide this kind of education for young people because actually adults are not necessarily any better at this and are quite often worse at this than young people. Um, and this is all really new and we don't, we're learning all the time about, about exactly what the harms are and about effective ways to combat it. So we've got to have really good resources in schools. I think, of course, then the question is, how do we actually make this happen? Because I don't think teachers at the moment, most teachers are not very well equipped to do this. Uh, it needs to come in at a young age because a lot of children are accessing social media way younger than the age at which, it's, they're, at which they're supposed to. They're using the internet from a young age and it's got to be reinforced through high school. So we need 
inform teachers at all levels. Uh, we know there's a, a real shortage of STEM educated teachers in primary schools. There's a big teacher shortage in high schools. So how do we actually make this happen? If we just say this has to happen in schools and leave it to the schools, I don't think that is at all workable. I think we need to be having conversations at a national level about how can we resource this? How can we upskill teachers? How can we provide professional development? How can we find room in the curriculum? I think there's a really good argument for a lot of, for some standalone lessons around specifically about these issues, but also there's a huge amount we can do about integrating this into the existing curriculum. A lot of what kids do in school is really, this is really relevant to, you know, they do research, they find out things on the internet, they have discussions and debates about different sides of arguments. So thinking a lot about how we how we improve that with, with these kinds of issues in mind. I think that's absolutely crucial, but there needs to be discussion and resources about this because it's not easy to do. And I think right now, Scottish education is a little bit in flux. We're looking at reforming the exam phase. We're looking at you know, Education Scotland and the SQA changing. So this is a really good time um, to actually make these changes, but we've got to be intentional about it and we've got, to, we've got to prioritize these issues and make sure we're discussing them and also making sure that young people are, are absolutely central in these discussions about how we do this. Thank you, Fiona. So, so, Zoe, turning back to you, in your opening comments, you highlighted the, you know, absolutely sort of paramount importance of keeping children safe. So, um, do you see that as uh, compatible um, with, or, or indeed maybe even more than compatible, actually, um, in sort of symbiosis with improving their education and awareness of the problems? You know, how, how would you see that working in practice? Clearly, one way to keep them safe is to shield them from all of this. But what Fiona's speaking to is you know, to educate them in the perils and hope that some of that will then come from within. So would you like to elaborate on that? How, how from a childlike perspective, you would see that um, being optimised? Absolutely. And, and to agree with uh, Fiona that education is, is critical to helping people to understand how to navigate environments, how to reduce the risk that they have around being in those spaces and how to keep themselves safe. But actually, for me, education goes much further. It's not just about putting the burden of that safety on young people themselves, but how do we all have a responsibility in it? And it's quite interesting, when I was looking at a, a recent report from Audit Scotland that said only one in six people are, are lacking basic skills to be able to interact in the digital world at the moment. If we've all got a responsibility in that education and the awareness that comes with it, we've got so much more to do than just placing the burden of that education in schools in a formal educational setting. And I think that's important because we can teach literacy and how to access content, how to manipulate it. But I think we should also be teaching behaviours. So how do you question what you're seeing? How do you check sources? How do you have an inquisitive mindset? And then link to that going much, much further and recognising that despite some of those guardrails and despite education, if something does go wrong and a young person is in a situation they were not expecting to be in, how have we had the really difficult conversations up front to empower our children and young people to seek help to know what support is available and how to seek justice from those people that have perhaps shared their content so that they are then in turn held to account too. So for me it's not just about the education, it's about the behaviours and the shared responsibility yeah. that really then can embed that across our people. Yeah, thanks Zoe. So um, if I pick up on, on your emphasis there on, 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 on teaching our young people, helping them to learn how to be inquisitive but to do so in a responsible way, so my own disciplinary background is in astrophysics and I often you know, like to highlight that physics in a way isn't so much about equipping our students with a set of facts about the world but equipping them with a way of looking at the world so that they can then interrogate it and explore it for themselves. And, and frankly, you know, that can apply way beyond just the limits of physics or science. It's, it's, it's a useful skill um, across all of society. So... Um, Jason, um, as the audience will have detected before my um, earlier remarks as well, um, you're, you're not from round here, although you've been a, a great supporter of the festival <laughs> over many yeah. years. Um, so, I, again, you know, a global perspective is interesting, but I'd be especially interested in any perspective you have on, you know, whether that inquisitiveness can lead people down some rather blind alleys in certain parts of the world. Oh. I'm thinking of maybe where you hail from. We have no problems in the United States, Martin. Uh, so I have two daughters, uh, 17 and 20. Uh, they are both of, I think, the same generation of a lot of the people in this room uh, who have never known a world without digital tools. Uh, you are the original digital natives, and you know more about how to manipulate and 
maneuver digital platforms and digital tools than I will ever ever learn. We talk a lot about equipping uh, them to make decisions, I'm sorry, young people to make decisions, uh, and we talk about empowering teachers to, to be able to teach them, but uh, these children come home to two parents who are technological Luddites. So we're not even speaking the same language. Um, uh, I, I have sort of followed up my kids every time the new platform comes out. I think I was the first dad who got on TikTok and Instagram, and um, I kind of did Reddit for a little while. It got scary, so I got out. Um, so I can't even. You, I couldn't even have a conversation about the content and to have a meaningful conversation about how to be literate about the information that you process because I wasn't even equipped to talk to them at a digitally literal level or literate level. So I think we have to just be really cognizant that, um, that we're, we're having this conversation from a lot of different perspectives and we have to empower people like me, parents, uh, or, or responsible adults who, are, who are, have children in their, in their lives to get past that digital literacy so they can actually have a conversation at the same level about information. Like what, how do you, how do you be uh, an informed consumer of information? It's a really big problem. Maybe bigger in the US than anywhere else. I only say that because we elected Donald Trump. I mean, <laughs> so it's pretty obvious we have problems. So, so Fiona, you, you touched principally on schools, and, and I, I think you know, we would all sign up to that, that that's um, in itself a, a major piece of work to be done to try and embed uh, this within our formal education structure and for schools but but in terms of that lifelong learning bit you know um how can our formal education institutions assist with that would you say i mean again doesn't need to be in north america uh if, if we content ourselves to solving scotland's challenges that that might be a, a good start yeah, I, I think it's really challenging. I absolutely agree with Jason that this is a this is a whole society issue. And I think, you know, we know that a lot of young people are getting on social media too young, and sometimes that's because they're going against behind their parents' backs. But actually, very often, parents are totally fine with that, and they don't really see any problems with that. So I think educating people more broadly about why these are, what the risks are, and what kind of things you should be considering is absolutely crucial. I think um, one really interesting thing to look into is how we empower young people to go out into their communities and to their families and, and talk about digital literacy and share the learning they're having in school. Um, but I think that older people particularly and people living in digital poverty are difficult to reach and it needs a concerted effort. So I think we need um, national promotion about why these things are important. So, for example, we already have TV adverts about how you might get scams that are put on during programmes that older people might be watching because they don't have that knowledge. So I think we need to look at how can we push, what are the absolutely core messages that we want people to be thinking about and how can we push simple messages very widely? I think we need to look at the role of community institutions. So libraries, I think, have a really important role to play because that's a place where people who maybe can't get online at home can go and access not just the technology but also support. They need people who understand this, who can share that with them. So there's people in libraries who can help but also classes that can be running. Um, but, of course, everything these days is running absolutely on a shoe string we're having a lot of cuts and you know obviously it's a very difficult question about what you cut and what you don't cut but I think we we need to be really aware that if we're making cuts in these areas this is the impact that it's going to have and if we want to reach these people we need the infrastructure and we need the national debate that's not just happening in schools but is reaching people very broadly. Thank you Fiona and so Angela that bigger piece of work in terms of reaching out to you know all demographics within society not just those who are currently engaged in formal education. Um, how does that sit alongside the sort of mission of, of the Information Commissioner's work? You know, what, what role would your team have in that? Yeah, so, I mean, firstly, I agree with the uh, whole society approach. I agree about making it part of the conversation. I mean, you know, we think about uh, conversations around road safety or sex education. We need to normalise conversations about um, information literacy and how we can protect uh, people's personal information. Um, so one of the things that my team does is try and make the, con the subject matter a bit more engaging and relatable. I mean, let's face it, data protection is pretty dry. Um, if you mentioned GDPR in a party, I'm pretty sure it's a conversation killer. Uh, but it doesn't need to be. And uh, we know that, you know, everyone's being bombarded with so many things that they need to know about and they need to do. Um, this isn't going to be the forefront of people's minds. So it's about trying to make it bite-sized, um, relatable and achievable. Um, so 
go and have a look at the ICO's social media content. So I'm going to take a sip of water. Which way it's going? Go and have a look at the ICO's um, social media content. Um, I'm really proud of the work that uh, my teams have been doing to make data protection a bit more exciting. So whether that's hooking onto big cultural moments, Taylor Swift, Barbie, the Super Bowl, um, we are trying to understand ways of talking about data protection in a way that is relatable, um, engaging, um, and understandable. Um, and I think it's actually starting to have a bit of cut through. So this year we launched our TikTok channel, please follow us. Um, and uh, in the first six months of this year, we have reached, without any paid support, um, over 200,000 people, over which I think half are under 34. So we're really trying to connect with a different audience that, as a regulator, we haven't connected with before. Um, and our social media content is uh, increasing in engagement. So year on year, we've got more engagement um, in, our, in our posts. And I think that is because we are talking about the issues in different ways and ways that hopefully connect with people better. Thank you. And, and just sticking with you for a moment, so I think we've highlighted in the earlier discussion um, how aspects of information literacy are, you know, truly global um, and very interconnected with different um, sections of society across the globe. Um, what about regulation? I mean, it strikes me that that would be a particularly challenging thing to do just because the legal framework around it often, you know, there, there may be a global dimension to that, but often it's very locally focused. So, so how, how does that work? How does the global aspect of it work from a regulatory point of view? So um, our children's code is world leading. Um, since we've introduced it three years ago, we've seen other countries um, look, look to our lead and look at how they might replicate um, a similar code um, in their own country. So we've been in great discussions with Australia, Canada, California in the States is le really leading the way um, on looking at introducing same provisions for young people. And that's obviously great because these platforms are global. And the more that we can introduce similar standards across the world, you know, the better protections there are for young people. Um, but it is about you know, making sure that, that we have a more joined up approach um, to regulation internationally um, and also in the UK. So the work that we do, um, it goes hand in hand with the work that Ofcom does uh, in making sure that you know, the privacy and personal information aspect goes hand in hand with the content um, and that there is a more joined up regulatory landscape that protects young people better. Thank you. Um, Zoe, um, I, again, you began, I'm coming back to it again, that core principle of every child should be kept safe. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on how that works globally, you know, given the, the circumstances of children in many parts of the world are frankly very different than they would be here in the UK, here in Scotland? Um, even if we agree that that's a really important core principle, how do we make that work given the sort of life situations of children around the planet? Yeah, one of the benefits of the internet is that it is global and you can now speak to people the other side of the road while doing so many different things and so many different experiences from, from where you might be at that moment in time. But with that globalisation of, of the internet comes the risk. So again, speaking from a, a child sexual exploitation abuse perspective, we could see somebody in the UK paying somebody in the Philippines to film a child to put that content online in another country and it's hosted in the Netherlands. So it gets really difficult to start to say what country's responsibility is it? Because the internet doesn't care about geographic borders or political parties or where you might be sat. It's so pervasive and, and so international and geographical there. So when we're looking at regulation as... Angela says having that ability to start to mirror regulation, I think across countries helps that everybody is in lockstep and that everybody is being sort of held to account in the same way. One of the things that Child Life is working through is, is actually helping other countries with some of just the absolute basic capabilities for child protection and law enforcement to be able to even just access data and information in the first place. Because then it's, it's no good for us to be having regulations around uh, putting disclosures and, and sending cyber tips about harm around the world if there's nobody on the other side that can deal with that harm. And that's what we can see. So particularly in low and middle income countries, it's a lot harder to even know what risk you're dealing with to access those tips and then have the, the people, the budget, the capabilities to go out and actually find the children that are immediate risk of harm. The regulation helps us to start to connect some of those pieces. It helps us to mirror the expectations that we have and then gradually, as society starts to connect together and we have the same principles in place, 
for me, that's when you would see our consumers and customers of social media starting yeah. to ask for and advocate for exactly the same things. And that's when we'll get the groundswell to hopefully make a bit more proactive action rather than relying on regulation and fines and penalties. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me turn back to some of the education aspects again briefly. So we heard from both Jason and Fiona um, different aspects of that that highlighted the challenge when you've got, you know, children versus adults that maybe don't even have a shared language about it, shared experience of um, the kind of technology we're talking about here. And I'm minded that, well, you know, there's, I guess, maybe another global challenge that's um, on, on many of our thoughts, which is, you know, the climate emergency and where um, efforts to embed that within our formal education system uh, may um, run aground when children are learning about all of that at school and then going home to an environment where their parents maybe have no awareness or, or have a, an awareness fueled by misinformation about many of those issues. So I wonder, are, are there any lessons that you're aware of that, that could, do, well, maybe again, turn to Jason first, sorry, to pick on the US again, but, you know, one, one would traditionally, maybe naively, view that as a, um, a, a rich breeding ground for misinformation around climate change. And, and is, are, are there any steps you're aware of that have been taken to try and use what's covered within the formal education system as a way to kind of, you know, by osmosis, um, educate um, other, other parts of society as well, you know, through, through the kids, basically. Sure. Uh, yeah. And this is part of the reason why regulation can be so difficult, right? Because the sort of the normative framework of what is or is not acceptable can be so different from one country to another. So you've got to really focus more on like a, a foundation of aspiration, like all children should be safe. Can we agree on that? Yep. But what might be safe in Scotland could be very different than what is safe in wow. Afghanistan, where safe is you know, children are being married off at the age of 14. Is that safe? We would say not. They would say... So there, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, in terms of climate in the U.S., well, uh, I spoke about this on a previous panel, so if any of you were here, I apologize. Um, Americans, the, there, there's no... The, it's the manifestation of climate change that actually is the opportunity, how it is experienced in other higher priority issues. So um, you don't really find conversations and debates about climate at a proactive, like, meaningful level, what you find is people are talking about immigration uh, because the impact of climate change is actually causing you know, uh, trouble in the global south. People go from where they have not to where they want to have. So climate manifests itself in, in a couple of different ways. Um, uh, I mean, we, yeah, we're a rich breeding ground of misinformation. It's 100% true. I'm more afraid of misleading information than I am of misinformation. I think my children, uh, who are obviously you know, very well raised and brilliant, um, they are pretty savvy about sorting out uh, bad information. Uh, they actually, it's sort of built into their psyche to double check sources and to know who the wackos are and not. Where I worry about them and where I see it happening with adults is taking information that is actually factual and then weaving it into a, um, a false narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. So uh, misleading headlines, uh, the misconstru uh, you know, misinterpretation of facts you and I were talking about earlier. Uh, hey, uh, inflation's at 3%. That's great, except it's not, right? It just really depends on your perspective. So uh, I'm, like, I'm much more uh, concerned about misleading information, and I think that is an outcropping of an inability to actually understand facts within context. And yeah. that's where the internet gets very saucy. Uh, because yeah. it's, because, you, because you're, yeah. you're, you're in your own channel. You're, yeah. You follow who you agree with. Yeah. And if you agree with the wrong people, that's yeah. all the information and, the all, and all the context that you're getting. So yeah. we need to teach our kids to be critical consumers of, of information and narrative. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's our... Um a good point. Again, I didn't mean to distract us from the main topic, but but my sense is that what our young people are learning about in, in high school, in, in a few minutes, we can hear from some of them. I hope it's landing well about the climate emergency and the importance of um, uh, work to protect the environment and net zero and all of that, that what you hope may happen is that some of that will sort of leak out to others in their family who wouldn't 
have the straightforward access to that. So I guess I was picking up really more on what you had said, Fiona, about having some core elements of the school curriculum yeah. to equip young people with some useful tools in the context of today's topic, maybe just a bit like climate change that will then have the sort of benefit of of some of that information leaking out to the rest of their families too. Do you, yeah. do, is I, that the hope? Yes, I, I would hope that. But also we need to have joined up conversations and we need to think holistically about the big picture. So talking about climate change, one thing that's really surprised me about all the fuss about generative AI recently, this has been huge. Generative AI is changing things fundamentally and people are really excited about all that and people are really worried about it and all the negatives and we hear a lot about this. Climate change has not been very loud in that discussion. You hear people mentioning it in con conjunction with that, but there are vast, vast energy implications for gender. It's hugely en energy hungry. And I would have thought, given how much we talk about the climate, given how much young people care about the climate, this would be absolutely the centre of the conversations we're having about generative AI, AI and it isn't. Yeah. And I don't know why that is, but I feel like we need to keep working on considering things from all sides and not getting really hooked on one angle of things without considering it in the broader picture and thinking about the other things we care about right. and how these things factor into any change that we're seeing well, or any well, choices I, I, that we're making. I, and that, that, that strikes me as an, an interesting point, an important point. For example, last week I noted a story about um, the electricity consumption of data centres in Ireland now exceeding the sort of domestic urban electricity consumption of the entire country. Um, and, you know, again, to, to pull it back to your great principle you began with about every child should be safe, you know, surely the best way we can make them safe is by having a planet to grow up in, you know, so joining up those issues in some sense feels like the way to go. I think maybe on a kind of meta level, joining up the issues is also partly about helping them understand how to make sense of a complex world. Yeah, it's almost yeah. like, a, you know, a parable for the challenge of understanding anything these days is it's also interconnected it's easy to just think ah you know it's too hard can't think about that well we need we need people to think about it yeah cool um thank you uh i think we're almost almost done in terms of these starter questions it's it's taken us in some interesting directions already so if if your if your questions are uh, bubbling up in your own thoughts then uh your your moment will soon be upon us um let me just um Again, just turn to you, Fiona, having touched on that, you know, energy consumption of um, generative AI. Um, you know, th the other aspect of consumption that we've touched on is the way that the social media companies consume that data, you know, on an almost unprecedented scale. And in fact, you know, in the context of generative AI, you know, as a scientist myself, it strikes me that the architecture they're using is not the most efficient by any stretch. But aspects of it still trouble me, you know, the dreaded E word, the algorithms and the, and the, and the way that that, you know, underpins um, how it all works. So what are your expectations in terms of, you know, the security of that data, the transparency, um, our, 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 our sense of what is being done with our data? So firstly, from a kind of technological perspective, where is that going? And then I'd be keen to hear from Angela in terms of how your team will stay ahead of that, which I imagine will be quite a challenge. Yeah. Well, I think from a technology point of view, we really need to think about the business model of technology, right? Mm -hmm. Technology is a vast, vast industry, and it's not only wants to, but it's fundamentally required to make a lot of money. And yeah. generally, new technology is extremely data-driven. Yeah. Generative AI works because it has access to vast amounts of data. If it doesn't have access to that data, it can't do anything. Uh, so I think technology drives a change, and we need legislation and perhaps also behaviour to try and check that where yep. necessary. Mm -hmm. And we need to think about these business models. So, for example, Apple is pretty good with privacy. Mm -hmm. That's because the business model for Apple is to sell hardware. Mm -hmm. That's where they make money. The business money for Google is to sell data. Mm -hmm. And I think we increasingly expect things to, to be free. We think things are free, but of course things aren't free. We're paying for them with yeah. our data. And if that's where, if that's how the business model of the technology works, yeah. this is an unsolvable problem. So we yeah. need to think partly about how legislation can control that, but also about how human behavior controls that. So I think we are shifting a little bit back from where people want everything free to where people are prepared to pay a little bit, maybe not to have ads, but maybe increasingly to protect their data a little bit. Um, and then technology has to shift. The business model will shift. Mm -hmm. um, and also legislation, you know, now we have to conform with GDPR, otherwise yep. you can't sell. So we have to, the market isn't going to fix that. That's got yep. to come 
from society making decisions about how individuals want to behave through education, educating people about why they might want to behave in that way, and through legislation and you know controls such as the things that you're talking about. Yeah. Angela, would you like to pick up on that? Yes, sure. Um, so, I mean, I think we have a saying at the ICO, new technology, old tricks. Um, we expect the same principles to apply in the offline world um, as we do, off we expect the same principles to apply in the online world as we do the offline world. So, you know, with data protection, the kind of founding principles are around fairness, <coughs> transparency and proportionality. And so it doesn't matter if it's AI or biometrics or any other kind of new tech. It's the same, it's the same principles, you know making sure that you're keeping people's information safe, and if you're deleting it, you're deleting it and disposing of it safely, making sure you're only using people's uh, information for necessary purposes, making sure you're letting people know how their information is being used. Same principles, doesn't matter what the technology is, we want to see those same principles um, applied. And there are some um, big things that we can advocate for. So we uh, really champion the use of privacy enhancing technologies. They're great if they can be incorporated in um, how these new services are being rolled out to make sure that um, data is minimised and how it's used um, in, in these services. There is maximum security as well for people's personal information. There are technologies available that can help as new innovations come on board, but we know that there are barriers to the adoptions of these technologies, you know, low awareness, <coughs> limited expertise, and uh, we recently held a workshop with some of the industry groups with some of the providers of these privacy enhancing technologies to try and understand like how can we increase the adoption so that people's information is better protected as um, the scale of technology uh, goes forward. Thank you. Um, so as we, let me just offer you know one more question to the group, but in particular in the first instance to you, Jason, drawing upon your um, experience in the political sphere. So we've talked a lot about information more generally. We've touched occasionally on the way that that um, colours and influences, uh, you know, political discourse and indeed political action. So, um, you know, what, what do you see, you know, looking around the room, we are, after all, a festival of politics. So if we think of ourselves as political citizens, how do we protect ourselves and how do we protect our fellow citizens to ensure that we're not sharing or indeed consuming misleading information? Uh, well, we've already touched on it a little bit, right? The, the, the idea that you don't just randomly, without any uh, forethought, uh, just forward on information. Um, I, you know, from a political perspective, I, I try to be, um, if not magnanimous, at least uh, understanding of the fact that a lot of people who I uh, disagree with politically, I think, are just misinformed. And so I try to have a little bit of sympathy for that. They're not bad people. They're just getting really bad information. Mm -hmm. um, they're not, th that's not being made any better by the fact that uh, X seems to kind of thumb its nose at some of the, some of the boundaries that uh, you, you would think should apply. I, I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, the intersection of government and business and sort of public citizen responsibility has to find an area where people feel empowered to ask questions uh, that we teach that from a really young level that we teach them uh, to be critical to think about what you're sharing to recognize that you're getting your information from people who you probably already agree with so it's a great idea to and I think I think young people are much better at this uh, actually uh, to have more than one uh, ideological resource mm -hmm. Uh, to, to be willing to listen to other people who may have different opinions. Obviously, you want to be civil, treat people uh, uh, as, as you would like to be treated. It's, like, it's that simple, right, the golden yeah. rule. Um, I, I'm encouraged not because we're necessarily getting better at this. I, I think we tend, to, um, we tend to go to our most, um, our most negative instincts when we are just angry or frightened or scared. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is basically all of politics these days, right? Um, so when I watch the, sorry, I'll wave a flag for 30 seconds. So when I watch the Democratic National Convention, uh, there's my children uh, who are dyed in the wool liberals. Uh, uh, I don't know where they get it from. I'm a pretty moderate <laughs> person. Um, had no enthusiasm for Joe Biden. He was like older than their grandfather. They just couldn't, there was no connection at all. They are out of their skulls for Kamala Harris. Um, there, so there's this incredible youth enthusiasm that there's actually something they can vote for, in part because she's just not Joe Biden, but uh, who I love and I think his legacy will be um, 
fondly revered down the road. Um, but there's just this joy uh, that's emanating, pouring out of her campaign and, uh, and her vice presidential pick, who's like every dad meme ever invented on the internet. Um, and I think that people tend to behave better when they feel better about the, the information they're consuming. Mm -hmm. So I, it may actually be uh, as simple as just be more positive and encourage people around you to be more positive, uh, because I think you tend to behave better when you're more positive. Yeah. Yeah. Zoe, let's give the last word in this portion to you, just as you, you opened, you give us that core principle I've been referring to, but you also along the way were highlighting the importance of, of you know, nurturing that inquisitiveness and inquiry, but, you know, just help provide the guardrails so that people are asking the right questions. I mean, does, does what Jason just said resonate with you? It does, and, and I was reflecting as Jason was talking, is, is that education is, is part of the solution, but not the whole solution. Technology is part of the solution, not the whole solution. Yeah. Uh, and for me, education also goes both ways. So it isn't just about the adults in the world saying, we've got the right ideas, we know what needs to happen, we know yeah. what's best. But actually asking children and young people to share their experience with us. What do they know? What's the lived experience? What should we be focusing on? What should our priorities be? Because I think that's the way that we'll start to build some of those bridges between different parts of societies and cultures. And then between us, we can target the right actions, the right interventions in the right way, whether that's responsibilities for social media companies, whether it's getting the right types of speakers for the right types of messages for the right types of content. But yeah, it's 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 a it's a, a whole collection that's not just going to rely on, on one of those elements alone. Thank you. That feels like a, a good optimistic note to end this first phase on. But of course, the really interesting part now begins as I turn to the audience and invite you to participate in our discussion. So if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and keep it raised until a microphone magically appears. We've got some um, assistants that will, will do that. That's especially important to make sure that Zoe hears the question because she's um, uh, online and currently joining us from, from sunny Devon or maybe not so sunny. It looks like it is sunny behind you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, again, I would ask you, if you can, to keep your questions and points fairly brief. That will enable more people to join our discussion. We've got about 40 minutes or so left. So, again, we, we look forward to hearing from you all. So, again, let me open the floor and uh, see who has a question for us. One at the front here. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, Jason. Um, thanks for your Hi, thank you for a really stimulating discussion. Thanks to you all. Sarah Scarrett, Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, the principle that's been quoted several times is every child should be safe. Um, I wondered about what about those children not in school and or already in vulnerable situations, including chaotic home environments, because we've talked about the whole society at one end and formal education at the other. What about those who are not engaged, who are disengaged, who have chaotic home environments? who may be in uh, different care systems and so on. So they're, they're a big concern too. Thanks, Sarah. Again, let me just open it to the panel in general. I mean, who, who would like to pick up on that one first? <laughs> well, I, I'll just start by saying I, that's, that's a really important but really difficult question. I mean, children who are not in the school system are already missing out on, on, a, on a lot of really important life lessons i think we need to be looking out for any opportunity to work with young people in in to come to them to to look at the ways in which they're being supported and seeing how we can integrate um the really fundamental things that, that are most important for them to access into that structure um i think that a lot of the ways in which young people in very difficult situations are supported is really underfunded and that makes it really challenging um but i think we yeah, I, I don't feel equipped to give a good answer to that, but I think we need to look at how we're able to reach those young people and then think about how we can integrate the really core cool things we feel they need to be learning to equip the world into those environments and also, you know, obviously try to support them to then maybe be able to access more, uh, more widespread education. So from the panel sort of collective knowledge base, do we have an awareness of studies that have been done to identify sort of particular vulnerabilities that the group that Sarah touches on? Um, would, would be at risk from. It's, you know, my instinct would tell me that's yeah. likely to be the case, well, but again, I, I, I'm I not... I think if you're talking about, if, if people want to access vulnerable children, then yeah. the more vulnerable they are, the more... Indeed, I'm, I'm thinking of the what you The more we need more consent, we need to be yeah. about that, yeah. 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 
Yeah. But I think this is where good, the role of government is really critical, right? Because the, in theory, government has its eye on that ball as well as on all of these other balls. Uh, those boundaries still need to exist. The, 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 this idea that the government is drawing lines about what should or should not happen when it comes to the safety in a, well, however you define it, that, that's the role. That's what we look to government for, to protect us. Um, and I think it's also a role where businesses can, play, can, can be more aggressive. Uh, you know, skeptically, you know, they, their job is to make money. Uh, but particularly in an age where we talk about reputation and brand is such an important thing, um, just because you're a, a social media company or a technology company doesn't mean that you can't also consider as, a, as an important issue uh, poverty or, or hunger or homelessness or whatever. You know, again, cynically, it's because they just want to elevate you to the point where you are a consumer. But practically, uh, biz, uh, government and business uh, environment, society works better when they are in partnership. But for me, government is always that, it, it's that safety protection element that um, you have to put that in power. It's all about Maslow's hierarchy, right? Like it's hard to you know, talk about safety when you've got a kid who doesn't have, know where their next meal is coming from. But you have to take into account the possibility that at some point this will be an issue and these boundaries have to be in place. And that's their job. I, I think we always have to keep in mind advocating for the young person and when young people in vulnerable situations are behaving in problematic ways online, we have to view them as victims and as vulnerable young people and not as perpetrators of harm. And I think actually as a society, or either perpetrators of harm or colluding or somehow responsible, we have to see that as, as a failure of the education system, a failure of the support system that the young person is not responsible for. And I think historically as a society, we've not always been good at that. There's been a lot of victim blaming and I think we have to be always mindful of that. Thank you. I, I suggest we'll move on to another question. And can I say, if you have a question, feel free to introduce yourself um, at the beginning, um, as our first questioner did. So we've got one over there on my right. Yeah. Indeed. Hi, my name is Frida. Uh, Angela earlier had mentioned that £12, 12 million pounds was fined from on by TikTok. And I was wondering, what do you do with that money? Is it used to like um, help to keep children safer? <laughs> Um, so that money goes into supporting some of the other work that, that we do. So, that's a good question. Right? That's such a good question, though. Indeed. I, I mean, do you feel that that's something that could be publicised a bit more? You know, the, the fact... Uh, yeah. uh, maybe it's, it's being done and I've just not been aware. Yeah. But, yeah. So that, the, the process at the moment with TikTok and that fine is it's going through Got some it. of the legal, the legal processes and, yeah. and, and appeals and so on. But essentially the, the money that we recoup goes back out to helping um, yeah. us do, do more work. To so that, that feels like a good news story for sure. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Um, so we've got one just a few rows in front and then we'll, we'll come back. Well, since the microphone's there, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, um, Fiona was talking about resourcing um, education, particularly in high school, and you know perhaps standalone lessons, perhaps in integrating into the curriculum. Can I point out that there is a resource there already? It's undervalued, underused. School librarians, you can kind of guess what I do for a living, but school librarians. Now we um, we have training in this. This is something that we do on a day to day basis. Um, the National Strategy for School Libraries, which came out you know, four years ago, critical literacy, information literacy was very much part of this and trying to show schools this is what you can get from your school librarian. Many schools are using this, they're you know, using them for these purposes, but there have been slashing cuts. School librarians, one of the first things to go when there are budget cuts and yeah. I've been affected by that in the past and it's getting worse and worse and I, I think I feel a bit like a dinosaur. I think we're going to be disappearing very soon. Um, and it's the question is how we can show people that to use the school librarians, we have the knowledge, we have the information, and we're very happy to teach the kids about information literacy and critical literacy. Yeah, so just see if you've got any ideas how we can promote this more. Thank you. Yeah. Fiona, do you want to go first on that? I think that's a fantastic point. And one thing I should have said, actually, is that this is not just coming from the outside and putting this in schools. There's a lot of excellent things already going on in schools. And I totally agree that school librarians are really valuable. So as I was saying, we need this conversation at a national level about how we resource all this. And this absolutely must be part of the conversation. What already exists in schools that is working? Let's not invent new things to put in there if there's already structures that, that are in there and working. And most importantly, if there's structures in there and working, let's not strip them out and cut them. So 
absolutely school librarians should be part of that resource um, conversation and we yeah. should be advocating really hard for that. Thank you. I mean, that's a really important point. You know, not least because you're part of the school ecosystem that isn't in a discipline silo. It's, it's you know, really buying into the whole this has got to be joined up argument, which it's is really important. Issue. This is the same with yeah. libraries. Libraries sounds a bit old fashioned. Librarians, you're yeah. sorting books out and arranging them in order. People don't see librarians or libraries for the full capacity of what they provide, which is absolutely at the heart of, of all this dig dig digital literacy yeah. Um, conversation. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm betraying my STEM background, but some like uh, information engineer sounds yeah. a bit more exciting <laughs> to me, you know. <laughs> Maybe it wouldn't to other people. Um, more questions. Um, so, if, well, we'll go over to the other side and then we'll, we'll come back. So um, that's just a couple of rows in front along at the end. Thank you. Hi there, thank you. Um, my name's Catherine. I work for an organisation that focuses on the prevention of violence against women and girls. And I know prevention was mentioned by the panel a wee bit earlier. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if the panel could say a, a wee bit more about the role of prevention in reducing harm online, especially for women and girls. Thank you. Who would like to pick up on that? I'll, I'll Thanks, Angela. I'll that. So um, it's interesting looking at the kind of prevention lens through um, the area that you mentioned. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed is... Um, a trend in data breaches that have had an impact on survivors of domestic abuse. And uh, one of the, it's an ongoing piece of work for us, but one of the things that we've really tried to shift is getting organisations to really understand like the implications when they do have like a slip of an email BCC and it goes out to you know an abuser um, who might have now got the address of uh, this domestic abuse survivor and trying to get them to see that that is not just like an email error, it's not just an administrative error, it has real life harmful implications. So that's a big part of, I think, what we're trying to do in terms of prevention. It's that kind of culture mindset shift. The work that we do about data protection isn't about processes, it's not about admin checklists, it's not about compliance. It's about real people and their real lives and trying to sort of play that back when um, we're engaging with some of the organizations who are handling people's really sensitive information um, in a way that really does protect them. Um, so. We've done uh, lots of work recently to try and just really understand like, what the impact is when someone suffers a data breach, uh, try and provide more resources to them in that instance so that they can better equip themselves to like, try and solve some of the, the, the impact that they face. But it's not just about sweeping up the mess after it's happened. It's trying to get organisations to actually care about why they need to put in better protections in the first place. This isn't about, as I said, a compliance checklist. This is about really protecting people from serious, serious harms if they get it wrong. Thank you, Angela. Um, any other comments? Um, Zoe. Yeah. Thank you. And, and just to say, I think it would be remiss of me from, from not talking about prevention from a childlike perspective as well. So when we talk about prevention, we talk about public health. I think, as I said, the volumes of what we're dealing with, exactly to, to echo Angela, are just too big to be going around sweeping up messages, trying to take down content that's on there and being shared and already harmful. So part of Childlight's role is to gather data and to gather that information in a way which is, is trusted and credible. And although it's great for me to start spouting figures and facts and data, actually it's the data that helps us to build the evidence case. Because of the evidence case, it's much harder to ignore that there are problems. It also shines a light on where the biggest risks are, who's facing the biggest risks, but also where the best protection works. And going back to one of the, the first questions around vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. education is, is a right, but often it's a luxury for many, many children around the world. Mm -hmm. So when we look at public health and prevention, education is part of it, but it also helps us to think about what are some of those protective factors, the guardrails, the technology guardrails that help to make online experiences and places safe. Because I think without the, the data and the evidence, it's very, very hard then to exactly evidence what needs to change. And then when we've changed it, the fact that it has worked. Because obviously what's happening at the moment is not enough. We're still seeing harm. We're still seeing huge numbers of, of abuse and exploitation online. Thank you, Zoe. Um, let's go to another question. So the gentleman over there, sorry. Uh, um, maybe take a second to get in the microphone. Uh, no, no, on the other side. Just because. Yeah. Thank you. Had, it, had his hand up for the last few goes, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Just to go, to go back to your very first point, which was about freedom of expression. Mm. I've always been very pedantic when people 
conflated that with freedom of thought. I always thought, well, I'm free to think. Nobody knows what's going on, going on in my head. But I think now that there is a danger of that people aren't being able to think in the same way. And they're not being given the same type of information, the, the same templates to think in. And there is a danger. I'm not talking about young people. I'm talking more about people in my generation that are, uh, have coped with two different systems. Thank you. Um, but, uh, uh, sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. Nearly, Go nearly ahead. finished. Uh, yeah. yeah. I actually find myself agreeing with uh, Jason there about old people. You made that point more succinctly than I did. But when, when were we ever happy to leave a discussion or an argument having changed our mind with anybody? Saying, oh, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a step backwards. Yeah. I think the template has changed. You, you never hear two two different sides of an argument weighed up against each other. I think that, I think the, the, the method we're looking at now is whose side are you on? Try and work out the best way to put your argument, the best way to, the best way to denigrate the other's argument and the other people. I think that's the way that we're looking at. But I think the young people's uh, imagination and resilience and resolve, you can see that all over the place now. And I'm hopeful about the future from that. Thank you. Um, any thoughts from the panel on that? Jason, yeah, they say that if you reach one smart, person in the audience, it's a win. It's so, a, yeah. Uh, we 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 are, are are now all in these information silos, uh, where we only we only look at and read and listen to things and people who we already agree with. Um, I think younger generations are a little more savvy than we are because I think we just we were sort of at the point where these these information silos were created. We were sort of in the thick of it, and, and we all just kind of went on our one way or the other. I think kids are more critical. Um, I also think that young people are, I'm talking about, talking about prevention, the point you made earlier, uh, the, the ability to, to press on the importance of critical thinking to our children, not that they're skeptics, but that they are uh, thoughtful about the things they see, that they don't get taken by misinformation or misleading or what have you. I think it just, you better prepare them by teaching them to, to be more open and critical uh, of, about sources of information and the people who are bringing that information to them. They just don't get taken by surprise. Mm. Thank you. Um, so we move to another question. So yeah, gentlemen over there on the other side. Um, <clears throat> Charles Mullen, retired civil servant. Um, I'm glad as this is a festival of politics that we can look at our own politicians beginning to take note of the need for government intervention in relation to the regulation of social media sites, uh, both at EU level and now beginning here with the bringing into force of legislation in the UK. Um, and I think the bottom line is with the social media companies that their bottom line is that they're going to try and make as much money as possible. And unless they are regulated, unless it is ensured that they are taking away untruthful and harmful material from their sites, they will continue to seek to make as much profit as possible. And of course, some like on X are quite cynical about this as regards under the banner of freedom of expression, anything goes. Um, now, I hope to see, we can see more developments of that kind of enforcement, be it in financial penalties, even perhaps criminal penalties. Uh, in the United States, I noticed Congress was taking a bi bipartisan uh, interest in this, but I'm directing particularly to the Speaker from the United States, does he think, given uh, the freedom of expression uh, under the Constitution, uh, does he think that anything in practice might be done, and including also the protections that are given to these companies at the moment, looking at them as platforms rather than as publishers, whereas we know that in reality they are not uh, uh, passive. They are using algorithms to push forward certain controversies. Do you think anything is likely to happen in the United States? <laughs> it's so tough. Um, so you've, there, you've touched on a couple of different policy uh, I'll call them problems. Um, I still steadfastly believe that the most progress is made when businesses and government work together to find solutions uh, with civil society partners. 
a business's core responsibility uh, is to make money. And I, I think it, it's, it's hard to tell a company not to do that. I think the government's job is to draw red lines about ways in which you cannot do that. Uh, and there are some things that we all agree on. And then we start getting into gray areas where it becomes less clear that you're talking more about values, which are uh, normative and, um, uh, and change. Uh, content moderation is a huge problem in the United States. If you are a social media company, are you, um, are you are n or are you not responsible for the content that is published on your platform? It's not nearly as straightforward as you might think. Um, and there are you know, very uh, smart people on both sides of that conversation who just cannot find a way of agreeing. And so, again, again the, or my first point about compromise is that you ultimately end up with something that nobody likes, but that probably is the, the best solution because uh, policy and absolutism do not work. Uh, and they are rarely found, but in the areas where we do agree, uh, those changes happen and what you did to TikTok is fantastic. Um, and there need to be more cases like that, but uh, it's, it's hard to tell a, uh, a social media company that has billions of pieces of content coming out every single second, you need to take off things that I find offensive. Well, whose definition are we talking about? Uh, your offensive and my offensive may be two very different things. So it's a complicated issue. Um, is you mentioned California, you were like country, 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 California. Uh, uh, and those of you whose geography isn't great, California is not a country, uh, though it is the seventh largest economy. Uh, it's really hard at a federal level to get anything done. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but all the AI regulation right now in the United States is not happening in Washington. It's happening in state capitals uh, because nothing happens in Washington anymore. And where it is being felt at a local level where people are hands reach, you know, arms ranked from their, from their legislators, they're telling them you need to do something. And I don't know what the outcome of that is because they're not like experts, right? Um, so it's a very messy question that you've asked and I've given you a perfectly messy response. <laughs> so. Thank you, Jason. So the question was directed through the, you know, the US lens, but Angela, any perspectives on it from a UK point of view? From a UK point of view, I would say, I think, as I said earlier, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you know, these are big social media companies that have built their business models to make a profit. But I think the role that regulators and regulation can have is being really, really clear on what the red lines are and what our expectations are. And we can do that through a number of different ways. So I gave you the TikTok example where through the purposes of a fine, we've um, taken action against TikTok for not protecting children uh, adequately on their platform. Uh, but we had a different approach with Snap um, over, the last, over the last year. They were keen to rush out an AI chatbot, but it was rushed out in a way that absolutely didn't take into account the risks to young people. And we know that young people are predominantly the users of that platform. So through you know, really tough conversations uh, with Snap, we've managed to get them to like, change some of the ways that that service has been rolled out in a way that does protect children, in a way that we're happy will protect children. So I think it's about using a range of different um, levers. It's not always going to be big fines, but I think you know that upstream work, that prevention, um, being able to influence those uh, services from the outset by getting in and banging at the table so that we can really get privacy you know, being thought about from the outset uh, are ways that we can make the, these platforms safer and better. Just add one quick point, because I, 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 I think it's remiss for me not to say, and I think we sometimes forget, these big bad companies, and I'm a pro-business Democrat, so, but these big bad companies, uh, the employees are parents, uh, and they are people who actually care about children and society, and I think sometimes we forget mm -hmm. uh, those big bad companies are, are composed of lots of human beings with emotions and feelings and who care about their neighbors and society, and, and that's attention as well, and I think just, just sometimes we forget that. Yeah, thank you. Let's move to another question. So at the front here. Near the front, kind of more like the middle, but. <laughs> Hi, um, my name's Julie. I work for Scottish Government Communications, mainly um, in the parental audience for Parent Club. Um, but I am also a parent of two boys. One 
in particular, who is 14, a um, 14 year old boy whose life is basically led by Snap, by Snapchat. Um, so what's on my mind a lot since, you know, we have a very like open dialogue with him, the things that I've seen that he's experienced through Snap have been, let's just say, illuminating, um, highly concerning, um, dangerous, what's gone on for him on there. Um, so <coughs> as a teenager, I feel teenagers' minds, teenagers' lifestyles are meant to be risk-taking. They're meant to take risks. They're meant to make bad choices so that they can learn from them. But here we are allowing them, and you know, I am, I consider myself a responsible parent, but I have let him have that as you have to almost, or mm -hmm. their lives are over. Um, so what's on my mind a lot is why, how, how do children have this? Like 12 year olds, 10 year olds, 14 year olds, 16 year olds. How, how can they have this at the fingertips? You know, it's like letting them make really bad choices with alcohol or really bad choices out there on the street. So it's just on my mind what can be done perhaps to delay when they can go on to these platforms like I know we're dealing with big businesses and big um, profits and everything but surely it's wrong <laughs> that, you, that they are on these platforms at that age when their brains are not fully developed and is there anything that is going on there out in the industry to try and delay the age of something like Snap in particular that's a big question but is there Thank anything you, out there that's happening? An important one. So who would like to pick up on that one? Well, I Fiona? would say there's something societal there to go back to what we were saying about the role of parents in this. And I have a 14-year-old boy as well, and I totally get what you're saying. If you say you can't use this, his life is over and it's terrible. But if that is the general feeling amongst most parents that this is really not okay, and all parents are telling their kids that, or most parents are telling their kids that, that's a different story. We don't see most parents saying to their 14-year-olds, you want a bottle of vodka? Well, all your friends are, so why don't you just get super drunk? You know, that's not a social pressure on most 14-year-olds because most parents are not okay with that. So part, I'm, I'm sure you guys can talk more about legislation, and that's really important, but also part of this is working with society as a whole to help parents understand this isn't okay. So it's not just you trying to control this for your child, but it's something that's happening within his social group, and that's so important for teenagers. Thank you. I, I, I would agree. Thanks, there was a really interesting piece of research by Ofcom, which I think showed, and this is not a critical um, criticism of, of your parenting style or any parents. <laughs> I'm a parent too. But it was just really interesting, this piece of research by Ofcom, which showed that um, for some sites where there is kind of age verification, uh, parents often are the people that help their children get over those um, uh, checks because they understand like the pressure, right? The pressure of being part of um, the, using, using those services and, and not missing out. So I agree with what Fiona is saying. I think we need to try and shift the kind of mindset of uh, how we encourage conversations, how we raise that information literacy awareness so that parents schools, children, everyone is you know, having a, a role in those conversations and, and understanding what some of the potential risks are. From a regulatory perspective, I think there are things that we are pushing um, platforms to do and trying to also understand how we can provide more safeguards. So, for example, <coughs> I mentioned age verification technology. There's a whole bunch at the moment out there in the market, whether that's self-identification, but I've already described some of the pitfalls with that because you can just get your get your parent to um, uh, uh, help uh, overcome that. Whether it's AI technology, whether it's third-party verification, I think there are loads of technologies out there, but we, better, we need to better understand how they're being used and the impact that they're, having, that they're having. And that's where we're working very closely with Ofcom to try and think about what better regulatory guidance and certainty we can put into the market so that those technologies are more effective in keeping kids that shouldn't be on platforms off them. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, uh, although of course it depends on the length of the question and the length of the answers. Um, I'd be especially keen to hear from some of the younger members of the audience if any of them have a question they haven't had the chance to ask yet or, or any comments they have. No pressure. No pressure. Yeah, you, 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 <laughs> of course, I have to define what is meant by the younger members of the audience at this point. Yeah, sure, let, let's, let's go to the front here. Our first question came from the front row, so let's go back there. I'm only I'm only thirty, so, um, but hopefully it's a question for the young people as well. What advice would you give 
um, I mean, everyone in this audience, of how to be smarter, safer, uh, more ethically literate people online. So one practical tip. Thank you. That, that's a, a nice question to sort of wrap up on. We're also going to hear from the panellists with their kind of summative comments in a moment, but let's do this one first. So, um, well, who would like to go first? But in principle, it'd be nice to hear from everyone. What's your, your one takeaway tip? <laughs> yeah. Um, what is my one tip? Um, uh, I guess, I mean, I guess just to think about um, where data is coming from and why people might want to want you to have a certain opinion and whether you've really looked broadly and don't be afraid of people with different views and I think generally in life people come to different conclusions but often have the same motivation you know people might support a different political party to yours but they still want a thriving economy and opportunities for young people they've come to a different conclusion about how to achieve that um, but don't assume that people who have different opinions to, to you are because they're fundamentally alien to you, but just they've gone down different paths and try and find um, points of commonality so that you can, you know, come to some agreements and understand each other's point of views and maybe shift your own position or theirs a bit. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to offer something? I think mine, mine might be a variation on that. Put total confidence in no one. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I guess my, my dad was, you know, don't trust authority or whatever. Um, uh, but I, you know, the, it, we've, it's a recurring theme. Just assume, uh, don't assume that because somebody else disagrees with you means they're wrong. Uh, listen to them, and as an adult with teenage children, talk to them. Mm -hmm. um, I know that when I tell my child not to do something, that is a guarantee she's going to do it. That applies to both of them. So um, I never had the conversation with my children about you cannot do X, Y, or Z, or in this case, you, we set boundaries. We had conversations. We said we think you have to be X years old before you do it and, uh, and have a conversation about what it means. And, and just keep that dialogue open. That's my thing. Keep the dialogue open. Uh, I really liked uh, something that I think we talked about earlier, which is be curious. Um, be curious, ask questions. Um, I think through asking questions, you're empowering yourself with information, uh, which helps you make better choices. So um, you might not think something applies to you. You might click yes to the cookies. You might accept the privacy policy, but just question, what is this? What are they asking me to share? What, am I, what are they asking me to give? Um, I think through asking the questions, we can be better informed. Thank you. Um, Zoe, would you like to offer something? I'm going to completely stall my be curious. That's always ah. the problem with going last. But I suppose if I have to add something to it, be curious and consider the consequences because oftentimes the consequences can be completely positive. You can have your mind changed. You can learn something different. But also sometimes the consequences can be negative. You could share something that puts you in a difficult situation. You could share something that's harmful. And um, I think it's the curiosity and thinking about the consequences that come together that probably help to make some of the curiosity a little bit more richer and directed. Thank you. Yeah. So um, some really excellent contributions. Uh, I found it fascinating uh, hearing the questions, hearing the discussion. Uh, and before we close, I'd like to invite each of the panellists just to give us a, a one minute sum up of what they're taking away from the discussion today. So that will largely build on what we've just heard in, in, in response to that final question. Um, I'll be fairly strict about the one minute, maybe not as much as, you know, just a minute on the radio, so don't worry about hesitation or deviation or repetition. Um, but I, again, we're just keen to hear what you see as the key themes and messages. So um, we have traditionally started at the end, Fiona. Are you happy to go first? Sure. Yeah, OK. I want to go first before everyone makes a point I'm going to make. Um, so I think what's really coming out of this for me is that technology changes so fast and as a society we're really struggling to keep up with those changes and what we have to do is keep talking about this, keep having these conversations, keep talking to parents about what's safe, keep talking to young people about what they're doing, keep listening to young people, keep these conversations really active and alive and try and get them out to all people in society um, so that we can think about how we want to respond, we can think about the legislation we want to push our legislators to make, we can think about the decisions we want to make about our own lives how we want to support our kids, how we want to support our friends and our families. Excellent. That well good. under a minute. That, that, that's good. Excellent. Um, so let's mix it up a bit again, Zoe. We don't want you to be, be dealt the, the, the difficult hand of going last if others have, have stolen your thunder. So let's go to you uh, next. Perfect. So you can, you can start your, your clock there, Martin. I think the scale of opportunity of our online environments is huge, but with that comes risk. 
education is clearly part of the answer for how we both protect and, and prevent harm from happening, but it's not the only answer. We've got social morals, we've got um, societal norms, we've got technology, we've got people behind it. Education goes both ways, so not about educating young people, but how are we educated as the people that work with protect, look after young people too. And my final point is thinking about who shift, who holds the power at the moment and where that power needs to shift to. I would argue that the power shouldn't necessarily sit with social media companies to control content, moderation, access, but should actually shift to the people that are using that content and we start listening to their voices instead. Thank you, Zoe. And Angela? Uh, so my three takeaways would be, firstly, there isn't a one-size-fits-all to solving this issue. Uh, we need to think about a case-by-case -case approach, and I think there's so many different um, approaches that we can take. Uh, I really like the point that we discussed earlier about this being a societal approach. It's not just about government or legislation. It's not about business or social media companies or civil society or young people. We have to work all together, uh, whether it's in education in making sure we're preventing some of these harms uh, and making sure that those safeguards and guardrails are in place. Uh, and lastly, I would say, you know, the regulator probably isn't the, the direct um, first port of call for young people to get their information, uh, nor is it somewhere uh, you might want to come and speak to. But we are really interested in hearing directly from young people to hear how they're interacting with social media, what they think about sharing their information and what privacy means to them. Uh, the ICO is turning 40 next month. And one of the things that we want to think about is what does privacy mean to you? What's the moment that you realise that your privacy really mattered. So come and talk to us, whether that's through our TikTok channel um, or other ways uh, you can find us on social media. Thank you. I'm turning now to Jason. You made me go last. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm a political pollster and a political consultant and a, and a bit of a historian. And I'm more convinced now than ever that the success of a democracy is predicated on its uh, on citizens being informed. Um, and technology does present risks. Um, I can tell you that 200 years ago, no one ever died in a car accident. So we have to find ways of maximizing the positive and mitigating or eliminating the negative. But it relies on people. Uh, and I keep talking about the young people as if I'm, I'm like, none of you fell asleep, so I'm really glad you came. Um, our future is in your hands, so please be informed and be and be not cynical, but be skeptical and ask the questions. Um, I, I'm afraid too many of us have uh, the, the horses out of the barn. We don't we don't uh, listen to both sides of, a, of an issue. And I think uh, younger people, there's still some promise there. Uh, democracy fails. Uh, democracy dies in the dark. So uh, in, being informed is just critically important. Thank you very much. So I, I'm sure we could continue this conversation for many hours, but alas, we have to end it there. Um, so let me first of all just acknowledge our partners, the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Childlight Global Child Safety Institute at the University of Edinburgh. And I'd like to very much thank our panel, um, Fiona, Zoe, Angela and Jason. So let's give them um, our thanks. But most of all, on behalf of the panel, um, I would like to thank all of you for coming along today and making such a big contribution. And it's such a stimulating event uh, can I remind um, our, our audience to fill in the survey? Uh, you'll receive that automatically if you booked via Eventbrite, uh, but there's also a few paper copies of the survey at the back of the venue if you would like um, to fill it in that way instead. Uh, and that will seek your thoughts on how the festival can be improved. So, again, uh, feel, um, feel free to, to offer any suggestions there. And um, let me also just finally, finally, remind you that there are more festival events running in fact, we're, we're working Jason very hard. He's on two events tomorrow. There's a panel on AI and deepfake politics. Um, Jason is sitting in on tomorrow at 11. Um, and there's a, a panel on incel culture at 1 p.m. and a discussion on the importance of responsible debate at 3.15 p.m. Um, I think this has been a very good example of responsible debate. In fact, to be honest, while many of us, many of the voices in the panel, have emphasised the importance of seeking a wide variety of points of view. Perhaps I worry that we are all too much of one mind today, um, but I take that at least as an indication that um, there is much common ground between us in tackling this very difficult topic. And, uh, and I'm grateful for that because, as I said earlier, just because it's difficult doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying to address it. 
So I, I hope that you are indeed able to join some of those other events. And thank you very much for coming along today.